I am a, happy to start our afternoon session with uh, what's expected to be a wonderful session as well. No pressure. Uh, so our first speaker for today, uh, for now, is Catel Valtelleux, a professor at the Centre National de, de la Recherche Scientifique, CENERS, and a member of the Paul Albert Favier Research Center at Aix-Marseille University. Her field is uh, the history of Judaism in the Greco-Roman world, and she's also uh, specifically uh, the Jewish literature in the Greek, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the rabbinic literature. She, uh, she published a few books, but her more rec most recent one, a heavy big one, uh, named Jews and their Roman Rivals, Pagan Rome, Challenges to Israel, Winner, uh, to Israel. Now, this book, is not only an amazing book, uh, it's also the winner of the National Jewish Book Award. Uh, and I have to say, as someone who has read it, it's uh, an incredible feat. And, uh, and to celebrate that incredible feat, the Center for the Study of Old uh, of Conversion uh, here at Ben Gurion will host a book event in its honor in uh, June 12, and you're all welcome to join us. It's gonna be via Zoom. We have uh, Seth Schwartz and Mara Nioff that's gonna talk about the book and Chappelle's gonna respond. So. This is a plug-in for uh, this event, and, and you're all welcome uh, to join us. And uh, Katel is going to speak uh, today about conversion. Yeah, so now I need to share um, the PowerPoint. It's OK. So without further ado, uh, most family work dealing with the question of the status of converts in ancient Judaism argue that conversion developed as a concept and practice during the Hellenistic period as a response to Hellenism and the disconnection between culture and ethnicity that became possible in a Hellenistic context. I refer to uh, the well-known book by Shay Cohen in particular, Beginnings of Jewishness. Yet the phenomenon of conversion is very poorly attested in sources dating to the Hellenistic period, a fact that poses a serious challenge to the theory of the emergence of, conversions, of conversion at that time. If we leave aside the testimony of Josephus and Ptolemy and Strabo on the forced Judaization of the Idumeans and Iterians by the Hasmonean dynasty, and if we focus on the evidence dated to the Hellenistic period, the sources that potentially document cases of conversion, be they real or imagined, sincere or insincere, are extremely limited. Okay. In the non biblical text, in comparison, the message of Judaism is amply attested in sources dated to the Roman period. Converts are found in the writings of Philo and Josephus, the book of Acts in the New Testament, the story of Joseph and Athena, rabbinic literature, of course, a few hundreds, but also in 19 Jewish inscriptions that refer to Gerim, Poselutoi, or Poseliti, as well as in numerous Greek and Roman literary sources and some Roman legal texts. The contrast between the data from the Hellenistic and the Roman period is stunning and could lead to the conclusion that the phenomenon of conversion to Judaism developed mainly in the Roman period and not in the Hellenistic one, notwithstanding the scholarly consensus. Hence the importance of the references to Gerim in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is, in compositions dated to um, the second half of the second century and the first half of the first century BC, namely the Hellenistic period. How are these references to be understood? Scholars disagree on how to interpret the term ger in the scrolls. Some consider that its meaning is still close to the biblical evidence, while others see the ger in the scrolls as a Gentile convert or a proselyte, it's not very different from the rabbinic. Scholars note quite anonymously that the meaning of the word ger 
changes between the biblical and the rabbinic periods and corpuses. In the Bible, the word is generally translated by resident alien, whereas the rabbinic gear is designated as a convert or a proselyte and considered to have become a Jew, to have undergone a change of ethnicity. But what does becoming a Jew exactly mean? Is it synonymous with becoming an Israelite? And if so, in what sense of the word Israelite? The meaning of these terms, Jew, Israelite, proselyte, convert, and the very notions of conversion and ethnicity remain somewhat fuzzy, leading to the question, what does the change between biblical and rabbinic gerim precisely consists of, consist of? And can we make such generalizations altogether? Several factors need to be taken into consideration, such as the existence of a ritual of conversion, the obligation to follow all the commandments just like native Jews, the Gerings marriage possibilities, the notion of individual choice, the connection to the land, the degree of integration into the people of Israel, and the dimension of irreversibility, namely the fact that the conversion creates a permanent change in a person's identity and status. Yet the transformation of the biblical gear into the rabbinic convert was a gradual and hazy process, not a linear one. As far as the integration of the gear into the people is concerned, of, uh, into the people of Israel is concerned, some biblical texts, such as Numbers 15, 25, 26, Deuteronomy 29, 9, 12, and 41, 10, 13, Joshua 8, 23, 35, and Ezekiel 47, 22, 23, already seem to consider the Ger as a member of the people of Israel. And I will refer again to the text that Dominique showed us this morning, Deuteronomy 29, 9, 12, which states, You stand assembled today, all of you, before the Lord your God the leaders of your tribes, your elders and your officials, all the men of Israel, your children, your women, and the gear who is in your camp, both those who cut your wood and those who draw your water, to enter into the covenant of the Lord your God, sworn by an oath, which the Lord your God is making with you today, in order that he may establish you today as his people. The man, Akim Yom Lo Le'am, and that he may be your God, as he promised you and as he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. If ethnicity is understood as membership in a people without necessarily implying common ancestors, then some biblical texts already attest to a change of ethnicity for the getting. They do not have, they do not have Israelite ancestors, but they belong to the people that, enter, that enters into a covenant with God. This is also what Dominic said, which pleases me. We're in agreement at least on that. Time limits do not allow me to discuss all the occurrences of the word gear in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have thus chosen to focus on the Damascus document, also designated as CD or D, which we know from two medieval copies from the Cairo Geniza and 10 manuscripts from Qumran, dated roughly from the beginning of the first century BC to the end of the first century BC. The main reason for choosing this particular work is that it is, the, it is one of the major sectarian or Essene compositions of Qumran, and the only one uh, together with 4Q279 that includes the gear among the members of the sectarian movements. According to Daniel Schwartz, however, the gear in the Damascus document should not be considered a Jew, but a foreigner, a Gentile, because the work reflects a priestly perspective that does not allow for the transformation of a non-Jew into a Jew. On the contrary, Joseph Baumgarten, Yonder Gilliam, and Carmen Palmer, among others, consider the Gare in the Damascus document to be a proselyte, a convert to Judaism. Palmer even argues that this work testifies to notions of mutable ethnicity and mutable kinship, meaning that the Gare has become an Israelite brother to native Israelites. In this lecture, I would suggest an alternative way of making sense of the evidence, 
which goes beyond the Gentile Jew dichotomy and is based on the distinction between membership in the people of Israel and Israelite lineage. First, I need to emphasize that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are no allusions to a process or a ritual of conversion for Gentiles. More generally, Gentiles are not a major theme of the Damascus document. But all passages related to them testify to the safe distance at which they must be kept for what seems to have been purity concerns and moral reasons. CD 12.8.11 thus prohibits to sell food, animals, and slaves to the Gentiles. There is no room for interaction with them in matters pertaining to the Jewish law, and it is very difficult to imagine the people behind D involved in a conversion activity. This point strongly differentiates the Damascus document from the rabbinic text, which depicts several rabbis discussing Torah, issues of Torah interpretation with Gentiles with or without a connection to a conversion story. Yonder Gillian argues that the Ger in CD must be seen as a Gentile proselyte who has been circumcised, is ritually pure, and has passed inspection by the Mevaker within the community. In view of Exodus 12, 1248, the obligation for the Ger to be circumcised in order to partake of the Passover meal, and of the fact that the Ger in CD fully participates in the life of the community, it is sound to conclude that the Ger was circumcised. Yet, we must admit with Daniel Schwartz that there is no reference to the girl's circumcision in the manuscripts. In my opinion, the absence of reference to Brit Mila suggests that it took place before they joined the community. Or, if we are dealing with Gerim who were sons of Gerim, a possibility I shall return to, that it was performed on the eighth day after birth. Similarly, the fact that no passage of Sidi describes the Gerim's rejection of idolatry simply means that they were considered to have given up idol worship long before entering the movement. One passage of Sidi, however, may allude to the conversion of a non-Jew. The reason for which it is prohibited to sell one's male or female servant or slave to the Gentiles is, according to Sidi 12, 10, 11, that they have entered within with the owner into Abraham's covenant. The biblical foundation of this statement certainly lies in Genesis 17, 12, 13. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. The others of the Damascus document clearly understood this passage to mean that a slave bought by an Israelite enters into Abraham's covenant. Moreover, they interpreted this participation in Abraham's covenant as meaning that the slave had become a member of the people of Israel, with a particular status distinct from that of the owner, but nevertheless. That the slave or servant had become part of Israel is shown by the fact that it is forbidden to sell him or her to the Gentiles. In this passage from CD, the point is not that circumcision is necessary to enter the covenant, as Daniel Schwartz again notes, the fact that CD includes, includes both men and women in its statement shows that it does not focus on circumcision. Circumcision is certainly taken for granted for men on the basis of Genesis 17. But in CD, the emphasis is only on participation in Abraham's covenant. This notion is absent from biblical texts pertaining to Gerim but foreshadows rabbinic developments that closely associate Abraham and the Gerim. Moreover, the notion that a foreign slave owned by an Israelite master becomes part of the people of Israel and cannot, cannot be sold to Gentiles is absent from the Mosaic legislation. The fact remains, however, that CD nowhere refers to Gerim as having experienced a process of conversion. 
be it through circumcision, immersion, or another ritual. According to CD 14 Frisset, Garen participate in the gatherings of the camps, the local communities associated with D. This could mean that the community had accepted in its midst people who had converted to Judaism before joining the movement. Yet another possibility must be taken into account that the gear mentioned in CD 1438 is associated with an inherited genealogical status and that we are dealing not with recent converts, but with people who were considered to be the descendants of the Gerim known to have been part of Israel according to biblical tradition. Contrary to rabbinic literature, biblical texts do not specify what happened with the descendants of Gerim, whether they could intermarry with Israelites and be considered Israelites with the passing of time, or whether they retained a distinct status. It's maybe forever in theory. I don't know. They don't say. The Temple Scroll from Qumran, a composition that is generally considered to precede the emergence of the sectarian movement, refers to the third court of the temple, and then, after a lacuna, states, to their daughters and to the gerim who were born. According to some scholars, this passage refers to the gerim who were born in the land, or born in the third generation, and are allowed to enter together with the women in the outer court. The lacuna after Noldu makes it difficult to determine what the conditions for entering the outer court precisely were. But such a text suggests that the word ger could refer not only to first generation gerim, but also to their descendants. In short, we cannot determine for sure whether the appellation ger in the Damascus document designates first generation converts or are ger, first generation gerim or descendants of Gerim. I now turn to a more detailed examination of CD 14 precept. So the passage states the rule for the settlement of all the camps. Serech Moshev Kol They shall all be mastered by their names, the priests first, the Levites second, the sons of Israel third, and the Ger fourth. And they shall be inscribed by their names, one after the other, the priests first, the Levites second, the sons of Israel third, and the Ger fourth. Thus shall they see, and thus shall they inquire about any map. The Ger is clearly a member of the community who participates in the session of the camps, the Machanos. Contrary to Deuteronomy 29.10, which mentions the Ger, who is in your camp, after the women and the children, here the ger is grouped with the men, for camps are exclusively composed of men in CD. By the way, there are no references to a giyoret in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in German. Insofar as the ger is a member of the community, he is a member of the people of Israel, for the community embodies the true Israel. The Israel who has repented from their past errors and follows the true interpretation of the Torah. This leads Calvin, pa Calvin Palmer to conclude that the Ger is a convert who has undergone a change of ethnicity. If we understand ethnicity as membership in a people irrespectively of common ancestors, it is possible to accept this view. However, the question remains whether we should consider the Ger in CD a first generation Ger or a descendant of Gerim. In the former case, he has indeed become the member of a people that was not originally his, and it is possible to speak of a change of ethnicity, again, but the, without imp genealogical implication. If, however, the Gerim CD is a descendant of Gerim, he has been part of Israel since his birth, and in this case, there is no change of ethnicity. Palmer does not discuss the possibility that the Ger may refer to a descendant of Gerim. For her, there is no doubt that the term refers to a recent convert. Moreover, she also claims that in CD it is possible to speak of mutable kinship on the basis of CD 
six, column six and seven. This, the, this passage enumerates various commandments to, that all the members of the community are supposed to follow. It states that all who are brought into the covenant are to distinguish between the impure and the pure and make known the difference between the holy and the profane and to observe the Sabbath day in its exact detail and the appointed times and the day of the fast as it was found by those who entered into the new covenant in the land of Damascus to offer up the holy things in accordance with their detailed requirements, to love each man his brother as himself, to support the poor, the destitute, and the gare, and to seek each man the peace of his brother, and let no man trespass with regard to, this near, to his near kin, rather, let him stay away from unchastity in accordance with the precept. Let each man rebuke his brother, in accordance with the ordinance, and not keep a grudge from one day to the next. And let him separate himself from all impurities according to their precept. And let no man defile his Holy Spirit as God distinguished for them. Now, this passage is replete with biblical references. First, the association of the ger in the, singul in the singular, as in most biblical texts, with the poor, ani, and the destitute, evion, recalls Leviticus 19.10, Deuteronomy 24.14, and Ezekiel 22.21. The parallel with Leviticus 19.10 is particularly interesting because the passage, the passage as a whole has many parallels with chapters 18 and 19 of Leviticus. Both texts combine ritual and ethical precepts, and CD columns 6 and 7 refers explicitly to Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18, which states, just recall, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, you shall rebuke your companion, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In this passage, the word ach, amit, ben amcha, and rer are synonymous. The neighbor whom one must love as oneself is the brother, the fellow Israelite, whom it is forbidden to hate. The book of Leviticus adds in its separate passage, verse to, uh, to, um, 1934, the gear who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you. You shall love the gear as yourself, for you were Gerim in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So that in the Bible, in Leviticus 19, the gear remains distinct from the native, but, it, but he is nevertheless to be loved as oneself, like the Israelite brother. Now, what does CD 6 7 do? It combines several sections of Leviticus. 19, 17, 18, in a different order and with small changes. Leviticus 19, 18b comes first in the order of uh, CD, to love each man his brother, brother as himself, with the word ach instead of rea, okay? to love your brother, not your neighbor. Then we have Leviticus 19, 17b with ach instead of amit, let each man rebuke his brother according to the commandment. And finally, Leviticus 19.18a, and not keep a grudge from one day to the next. We have another interpretation of Leviticus 17.18 in CD column 9. And so in my thoughts of Leviticus 19.18a, I interpret the term as a rare. And this is the one of the rare of the one who has entered the covenant, meaning the new covenant in the land of Damascus. Is the foundation of the community. Then, uh, we are still with column 9 of CD, 9, 10, and 8, of Leviticus 19, 17, 18. And in this case, the word Amit is replaced by Rea and not by Kach, as in Kach 7, 2. In short, here's the main story. The different rewritings or interpretations of Leviticus 19, 17, 18 in CD show that out of the four categories found in these biblical verses, ach, amit, belamcha, and rea, the other six point only ach and rea, which are interchangeable. Ach, rea, and Now, if we read the 
The use of the word ach in itself is not sufficient to indicate that new kinship ties in a literal sense have been created between the Ger and the native Israelites within the community. The brother in Sidi is a brother in the new covenant, a spiritual brother, one may say, not someone who has received a new lineage and has been included among the descendants of the patriarchs. Neither the acquired slave nor the Ger is referred to as a child of Abraham in CD. In contrast to rabbinic and later Jewish traditions, CD implies no legal fiction of adoption nor a new genealogy for the Ger. I refer you, for example, to Yerushalmi, the Goim 1 4, Maimonides, and other traditions. So, to, to, to make this point very clear, in CD, the emphasis is on covenantal participation, not kinship. That the distinct non-Israelite lineage of the Ger is not erased through his integration into the community is shown by the hierarchy between its members attested in column 40. This passage displays a clear hierarchy that is based on birth and genealogical status. Priests are sons of priests. Levites are children of Levite fathers and Israelites in Israel are people who are born in the other tribe. The inclusion of the Ger in the list, in the singular, again, shows that he is considered a member of the community of the New Covenant, and thus, I repeat, of the true people of Israel, yet holds the lowest status because his genealogy differs from that of an Israelite, a Levite, or a priest. This position is comparable to the evidence found in some rabbinic texts that pertain to the girl's matrimonial options, as in Mishnah Kiddushin 4.1. In other words, the girl in CD is considered an Israelite in the sense of a member of the people of Israel, but he is not considered a Ben Israel, a descendant of one of the tribes of Israel. This distinction between two possible meanings of the word of the word for an Israelite is fundamental. To summarize. We cannot know for sure whether the appellation of Ger in the domestic document designates first generation converts who were already part of Judean society before joining the D movement or descendants of Geri. We can state, however, that the Ger is fully part of the community and thus part of the people of Israel. 
Yet he holds the lowest status within it because of his non-Israelite lineage. In contrast to some biblical traditions like Deuteronomy 29, however, the Ger is included in the group of the men gathered at the session of the king, rather than relegated to the ruling. That seems to be a distinction in the a few centuries later in a Roman context, which transforms the convert into a child of Abraham. Thank you for your attention. So the chair is gone. We're <laughs> going to have to do it by ourselves. <laughs> yes, Danny? Thank you So first of all, uh, I don't, I'm not saying that there is a contradiction between being a member of the people of Israel and, and not being a Ben Israel. I see no contradiction is in that. That's precisely my point. That precisely the, the people of Israel is, is uh, composed of people who are Ben Israel and also of people who are not Ben Israel. And I think that's what we see already in Deuteronomy 29. And I think this is what that continues in the evidence from the Damascus document. Just that here the integration becomes stronger precisely because this, there is this sectarian community context. But, but, but first of all, I don't see a contradiction. I see precisely just two aspects of the reality that we must hold together and not uh, oppose one to the other. And, and then uh, you say it's a religion, it's Qumranism, it's Judaism. No, it's not Israel. I disagree. The MCD, they see themselves as the true people of Israel which is why I've, I have insisted on that, that he is a member at the beginning, from the very first chapters, you know, you have the, the Shavay Israel, but those who have returned, yeah, but, but they are Israel, they are the true Israel, they are the people who are really faithful to the covenant that God made with Israel. Yeah. Okay, but, but, but they consider themselves as being the real Israel, the true, the real. I mean, we, we should read CD as a whole to, to make this point, obviously. But yes, I mean, they are, the, they are the, the, the rest of Israel, if you prefer, to use a, a biblical expression. And, and the fact that the Gear is part of this rest of Israel, he is part of Israel. I mean, even if, you know, and the, the, the native Jews, who have not come back to the Torah according to the interpretation of the community are not Achim anymore. So, uh, yeah, there, there is a kind of redefinition of who is within and who is outside. And the third point, uh, son of Abraham is different from son of Israel. Uh, absolutely. And that's a very important point uh, because uh, it is true also in rabbinic literature. Uh, I mean, they, we are speaking now about rabbinic literature, and it, it doesn't make you a Ben Israel. And as a matter of fact, in texts such as Mishnah Kiddushin, you don't have the same status for Gerim and for Bnei Israel. You, you have the same kind of distinctions between priest, Levite, Bnei Israel, Gerim, and then you have all these other categories that are not found at Qumran, such as the Avadim Mishnahim, freed slaves, and so on and so forth. So we, we still have these genealogical divisions and subdivisions within the people of Israel. Uh, as far as Arachic issues are, some Arachic issues are concerned in, in rabbinic texts. But it is nevertheless significant in my view 
that uh, the, the convert, the Gerim, are seen as children of Abraham because it creates a kinship. It's not the same status as Ben Israel, okay, but it creates a kinship. Uh, that's that's still, whereas in, in CD, I see no kinship. I, I don't see, I mean, I think it's a really a spiritual kinship. It's not at all a new genealogy. They are not described as children of Abraham. Nothing of that exists in CD. Yeah. Thank you. It's not a quotation for a biblical text, but it's a kind of biblical language that they use. And then you have texts that reject those languages, that exclude them from the second edition temple, that, uh, yeah, they will not enter, they will not be part. And there it's tricky, because is it just that, you know, they are the kind of Ezra and Nehemiah guys who don't want Gerim, who don't want people with kind of intermediate status? Or is it a reaction to current evolutions in Judean society at that time? There we really lack uh, details in the text to know what is at stake. Why are they excluding them? So are the, are, some scholars think there are chronological evolutions. Some scholars think there's a diversity of views of Gerim within uh, the broad uh, Essene movement just as we have different opinions among the rabbis as well, you know, sometimes positive, negative, so it's not really clear. But there is a variety of views. There, There is a variety of views, yes, absolutely. And the, the Damascus document and 4Q 279 are the only texts that really mention the Ger as a member of the community. The other ones you don't know, it's like he's part of the society, but not precisely the community. Okay. So um, we have heard that this girl is in some ways, and his father was in some ways, and this is a genealogy of this. But the first girl, how did he become a girl? And I, in my sense, is that this is a question. We really don't know how he feels. It seems that those were slaves, and they are now considered living in. Um, Actually, immigrants, which are like in the back. So, those, so this genealogy of Gerim, how would it be? Yeah, so this is a question. This is an open question for mm -hmm. CDs. Are we dealing with descendants of Gerim or with recent converts? So, uh, the fact is, we, we have no clue whether there were Gerim uh, in Judean society in the first century BC, for example. Whether people were really late Gerim, or... you heard though that the literature this morning saying, "Oh, I think these texts are very late, very, very late, end of Persian period, or something like that." So, what so, what uh, sociological historical realities are we dealing with here? <laughs> and even and even in CD, I mean, it could be argued. Um, I mean, you could it could be a good kind of uh, theoretical statement, or you know. We have to take into account all the categories that are described in the Bible, even though they are really thinking about the way their community functions. So it, it gives some credit to the view of people who argue that this is a historical reality. They really had people labeled carrying within the book. But, uh, but some of it, some, at least one scholar has argued that this is just a, uh, just literature. I mean, that it's just, you know, a kind of theoretical uh, statement about the game. So. I, I was, I was struggling with the, with, with the following argument that um, since we have a similar structure as the division of the evolution, so maybe the first to the also, also, we have to, we can also project back to a bit because uh, you and assume that this is the same. Uh, but yeah, that's still a question. 
well, there are many elements that are missing. So it can it remains a question, but I think uh, there are many, many, many differences, both with the biblical evidence on the one hand and with the rabbinic evidence on the other hand. So it's really a kind of in between um, in, the, in the Damascus documents. I don't think it's, it's the world of the rabbis yet. So, and, and if you look at the biblical evidence, you, you can come out with these four categories of Chris, Levite, Ben Israel, and Ger very easily. You, you don't need to have the Mishnah to have it. You, you can have it just because of the biblical text, which would make more sense. Mm -hmm. And to think that already at that time, uh, the Damascus document, its composition is generally dated to the second half of the second century BC. And I, I, don't, I think the Mishnah is so much later. And so much more developed also in, in the way it categorizes people according to their genealogy. So maybe for the chief working on the docs, he would say, well, there were a few guys, they say they just made this concept. Later on, it became so important, but yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> The, 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 the rule of the community also does not mention Gerim at all. There, there are no Gerim in the rule of the community. There are Gerim in the Damascus section, but not in the rule of the community. So it's very interesting. And of course, this silence has been uh, commented on by the virus scholars. In, in CD, what we see is that I think Ach and Rea function in the same way. So, because you, you saw at some point the, the same uh, ver part of the verse that from Levit Leviticus 19, once they change it to Ah and once they change it to Rea. So it doesn't seem that there is a difference for them. And it makes sense since Ah is as this kind of companion, fellow meaning, why not use Rea? Uh, but I have no particular solution to the question of whether, of why the, the, the rule of the community does not use the word Ah. This, no, I have not the answer to that. Maybe one question from one more question. Yes, who's there? Last one. You mentioned that it is known as the Oret. Is that in Toronto or is it in Toronto? I think in, in Toronto, in general, there is no author of the Oret. Well, well, you know. Uh, for a long time in the, in the biblical world, uh, women, foreign women, are integrated into Israel for marriage. They, they don't really need a conversion. They, they just become you know, the, the wife of the certain Israelite man and, and, the, and the tent of the family is the tent of the God of Israel. And that's it. There, there is no conversion for women. So we can interpret it in many ways. We say, like that, even probably would say, there is no ritual of conversion for women at that time. So the, the, the notion of Giyoret presupposes a conversion uh, process or ritual for women, which we are not sure that it existed at that time. So this, that's one, one way. Or you could just, but the other, the other thing that one could say is also that um, women are not really community members. They are just the wives of the community members. So they have no status as, you know, as, why? Because because they couldn't marry yeah, in Karen. Yeah, so they 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 probably speak not women at all. They are just like mentioned because the some members have women and children and cattle. But but that, they have no role. They have absolutely no role. No. Uh, so yeah, I mean they, they wouldn't speak about it. But but the other question that your question uh, interestingly raises is that would Gerim be able to marry uh, female Israelites? Maybe yes, if the identity is patrilineal, and at that time it is certainly still patrilineal, then it's not a problem. A male Ger can be married to a woman who is an Israelite. And nevertheless, the child would be a girl. If, if we suppose that there is a kind of genealogical transmission of status that's really systematic, 
which I, I'm not sure of, but let's imagine. Then even if the woman is Israelite, it doesn't matter. So we don't, we don't, you don't really need a Giyara. But anyway, <laughs> many well, questions to which we do not have answers. Yeah. Well, we just like to stop. Thank you very, very much for this. And our next speaker, which I need to upload to PowerPoint. No. Yes, mm. uh, up and down. Okay, uh, let me introduce you first. So, yes. Professor Daniel Schwartz is a professor in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, Danny is a historian of the Second Temple period, and among his books, there are many. So, uh, I'll just mention that there are two kinds. There's annotated commentaries on major books of Second Temple period, uh, Second Book of Maccabees, and just the Vita, and everything. Uh, and then he has a few monographs. Uh, I love the Agrippa one, uh, Last Jew, uh, Last King of Judea. But also, he's been dealing also with uh, the history of scholarship recently, and among his books, Between Jewish Posen and Scholarly Berlin, The Life and Letters of Philip Jappe, that came out in 2017, an article he wrote to a book that we edited about uh, uh, for the Baumgarten uh, press drift on uh, Bickerman. Uh, so uh, he does that too, which I find extremely cool. And I invite him for his uh, uh, presentation on Does Circumcision Make a Male a Jew? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. This. Yeah. So much of what I've been doing in the past many years, this paper is in large measure an attempt to understand an issue raised in one of the last books of Josephus' Antiquities. Actually, it's raised there twice. Once in the story about the conversion of the king of Adiathene, and once in a piece of nasty gossip about one of Herod's great granddaughters. As we shall see, moreover, the same issue is raised by a passage in Josephus's life, which is actually an appendix to the Antiquities. I've been struggling for years to finish my translation and commentary on the last three books of the Antiquities. I'm therefore grateful to Cattell and to Michal and all of the organizers for this opportunity to focus on one of the many issues that they raise. However, my point of departure, which got me thinking about that issue, comes from a story I ran across in a very different context, a story that pertains to an episode very far away from Josephus and from antiquity. Sometime early in the 1920s, sometime early in the 1920s, a non-Jewish man in Gablonz, Hungary, let's call him Max, fell in love with a Jewish woman who in rabbinic literature doesn't need a name, <laughs> and therefore decided to convert to Judaism in order to marry her. According to the local rabbi, Herman Bonnet, who wrote a letter on the subject a few years later, Max studied Judaism seriously and sincerely, and as the years went by, he became in terms of his practice and also his social ties, more and more a part of the religious Jewish community. By 1926, Rabbi Bonnet was therefore willing to convert him to Judaism. However, what ensued was not marriage and life happily ever after. Rather, Max's physician intervened and ruled, given the fact that Max suffered both from a heart condition and from diabetes, that circumcision would be dangerous for him, perhaps even life-threatening. Therefore, he forbade Max to undergo circumcision. Since circumcision is, of course, along with ritual immersion and the commitment to live according to Jewish law, one of the three requisite parts of the process of rabbinic conversion, the physician's decision created quite a dilemma for Rabbi Bonnet. On the one hand, conversion without circumcision seemed to be unprecedented. How could a rabbi undertake it? On the other hand, to deny Max the possibility of conversion after he'd been after he had spent years preparing for it, together with the local rabbi, and had become immersed in the Jewish community and severed his ties in a large measure to his former community, all of that seemed to be inhuman. 
How could Rabbi Bonnet, who knew Max and accompanied him along the way, refuse to complete the process? Here then were the makings of a controversy that would within a few months blossom into a large corpus of correspondence, detailed rabbinic responsa from the world's most prominent rabbis, rabbis of the day, who all concluded that Max could not convert to Judaism. And I show you here a few of the pictures of the main people involved without getting into the names. On top, you have Weinberg, the head of the, of the Berlin Rabbinic Seminary. He got the question first. He answered negatively. Bonnet protested and argued. So Weinberg sent the question off to Vilna, the Rabbi Rosinski, who was the head of Agudat Yisrael at the time. He also answered negatively. Bonnet still wasn't satisfied. And Weinberg still was unhappy. It was like Rabbi Stav before. It's not pleasant to give answers like that. And therefore, they sent it off to Jerusalem to Rabbi Cook. They all said no. I don't know how Max's story ended. Rabbi Bennett himself died later that year, 1926, and I have not found any continuation of the story. Leave that to our imagination. But the correspondence, detailed and lengthy correspondence remains. And when I came upon it and realized that Josephus frequently deals with the same basic issue, but his position was very different from that of the 20th century rabbis who told Max he couldn't convert, it became the catalyst for my discussion here today. Of the legal considerations that were adduced in that debate, two were, as is so often the case, in the realm of practical community politics or tactics. Would a positive ruling encourage other Jews to abstain from circumcision by suggesting to them that it's not really an absolute requirement? Or, would a positive ruling open up the floodgates for unscrupulous physicians who would, perhaps for a price, probably for a price, supply would-be converts with dispensations from circumcision, even when there was no real medical justification for that? Here, however, I will not focus on those arguments concerning the public's potential reaction to a permissive decision. Rather, I'll focus on two other arguments, arguments of principle, namely on the two analogies Bonnet adduced in order to argue that conversion should be allowed. And then I'll focus on the rabbis and the responses of the rabbis around the world who rejected those analogies and forbade the conversion. As we shall see, their rejections of both analogies derive from a single basic assumption about the efficacy, the point of circumcision. First, Rabbi Bonnet pointed to the undisputed fact that an uncircumcised son born to a Jewish mother is considered a Jew. That comes in two varieties. Either the boy was not circumcised because it was dangerous, had some disease which prevented it, had brothers who had died from circumcision and it was assumed it's dangerous for him as well. And in such a case, the baby was exempt from circumcision or else he was not circumcised because his parents were delinquent. And if he himself, upon becoming of age, fails to have himself circumcised, he too is considered delinquent. One way or another, however, he's still considered a Jew. Rabbi Bonnet argued, therefore, that that shows that being circumcised is not a necessary condition for a male being a Jew, and infers that the same should be the case for Max as well. The rabbis who rejected that argument did so because they insisted on distinguishing between a son of a Jewish mother, who was therefore Jewish by birth, and Max, whom only conversion could make Jewish. In brief, they argued, one cannot conclude from the fact that someone who is not in need of conversion can be a Jew, although he cannot be circumcised. One cannot infer from that that someone who is in need of circumcision, excuse me, who is in need of conversion can be a Jew, although he cannot be circumcised. Rabbi Burnett also pointed to the fact that women may convert to Judaism, although they cannot be circumcised. And that there's also a lot of authority for the rule that a eunuch who has nothing to be circumcised, may convert without circumcision. Those cases show, he argued, that people, using that general term, that people who cannot be circumcised may convert to Judaism. In response, however, the other rabbis insisted that those two cases show only that people who have no foreskins may convert to Judaism without circumcision. Accordingly, those cases supply no precedent for someone like Max, who does have a foreskin. Note now, this is important, 
that their response is based on two presumptions. One, that there's something negative about a foreskin or about having a foreskin. As the ancient rabbis put it, it's hateful or disgusting, ma'us. And I give you two, two, two texts that say just as much. Um, one from the Mishnah, where, which points to the fact that when you want to say something nasty about Gentiles, you say they're not circumcised. And the other one in Bavri Svachim, which talks about why Jeremiah has to refer both to people who are uncircumcised in heart and people who are uncircumcised in flesh. And as part of the argument, they say, well, if it only mentioned those who are uncircumcised in flesh, we might say that's because it's really ma'us, disgusting, not to be circumcised in flesh. And it goes on with its argument. That's all I need. So their presumption is that there's something wrong, bothersome, prohibitive, impeding about having a foreskin, and Max has one, as opposed to women and eunuchs who do not. Their other presumption, however, and this is something which came up already in Cattell's introduction this morning, when you talk about the relationship of completing conversion and undertaking obligations of Jewish law, their other presumption was that circumcision is needed not to accomplish conversion, but rather only to remove an impediment to conversion. Therefore, it's not required when there is no such impediment, as in the cases of women and eunuchs. Conversion is, in other words, just like another element of the rabbinic conversion process, ritual immersion, which typically functions to remove something in that case, impurity, in this case, foreskin. Of the three items then, namely undertaking to live according to Jewish law, circumcision and immersion, it leaves only one of them, namely the first, having a positive effect. That leaves the transformative process of conversion, rather than merely removing impediments to it, to the element of the commitment to live according to Jewish law, a commitment which, as in Max's case, usually comes after a period of learning and experiencing what that entails. The modern rabbinic co correspondence gets into other various, various other issues, but what I have is sufficient for the current framework. Namely, I would emphasize the rabbinic position summarized above regarding both points, agreed that it is not circumcision that makes a man a Jew. Rather, two other things can do that, birth as a Jew or commitment to live as a Jew, circumcision at best can allow that second thing to happen. Moving now to antiquity. First, I will briefly note that the assumption that birth makes a Jew a Jew seems to have been universally accepted. Nothing surprising about that. Of course, not everyone ag always agreed about how Jewish birth was defined, especially in cases of mixed marriages which raised the question of patrilineal versus matrilineal descent and other questions, but that doesn't have to concern us now. What is essential is the presumption that Jewish birth, however defined, defines the newborn as a Jew. After a brief discussion of that for a particular reason, however, I will show that in contrast, the other assumption that circumcision does not make a non-Jewish man into a Jew, but only removes the impediment to that, was not shared by Josephus. The first rule that, Jew, that birth makes a Jewish boy a Jew, and so circumcision is simply one of the obligations that imposes upon his parents or later on him. One of the things that should be done along the way seems to be almost self-evident. I raised the point only because several years ago, Friedrich Schiffer wrote an interesting paper comparing Matthias in the first book of Maccabees to Joshua in the book of Joshua, who Joshua is reported to have circumcised, uncircumcised Jewish children in Joshua chapter five. And Shifter Rauch writes in commenting on this, that pious or nationalistic Jews thought that uncircumcised Jewish born boys were schlich, plain and simple, not part of the people. It's a very far reaching assertion. Sie waren schlich keine Mitglieder des Volkes, pure and simple, not part of the people. They only became to be a part of the people after they underwent circumcision. Which means, if I take this the way it's written, that there's not really any difference between a 
boy born to Gentile parents and boy born to Jewish parents. And they're both non-Jews until something happens. While it's indeed likely that Jews felt a repulsion or distance vis-a-vis -vis uncircumcised Jewish males, it's doubtful that as a matter of law, Schiffer's conclusion can be accepted. That's because it must be, despite the general language of 1 Maccabees 246, that Mephias and his merry men limited their forcible circumcision to children who were born to Jewish parents. And that seems indeed, in fact, to be explicit in the reading of the Sinaiticos, which I wrote here. What it says in the main version, this is um, uh, uh, Kepler's uh, edition, it's also the same in Ralph. They circumcised, forcibly circumcised, uncircumcised children that they found within the borders of Israel. Sinaiticus reads, among the sons of Israel. You can wonder about that, but one way or the other, even with the other reading, it derives the argument that they confine their activity to children of Jewish parents derives from, I think, a very strong, although indirect argument. Namely, if Mattathias and his men circumcised non Jewish children, that must have bespoken the notion that there's no room for non Jews or at least for foreskins anywhere in Judea. There's something bad about, repulsive about uncircumcised men and foreskins in Judea. And I played around with that idea, and other people have actually accepted it. One might think, in fact, that's what's indicated by the words within the borders of Israel in the majority text. However, if that were their principle, there would be no explanation for why they did not forcibly circumcise uncircumcised adult males as well. Nevertheless, they confined their activity to children. So the fact that their activity was limited to children indicates that Mattathias' activity is to be understood as completing the story which has begun in 1st Maccabees chapter 1, namely that Antiochus forbade Jewish people to circumcise their children. The same interpretation, limiting the forced circumcision to Jewish children, which means the Jewish children are supposed to be Jewish children and not non-Jewish children by birth, is clearly indicated by Josephus in his paraphrase of this in Antiquities 12 to 78. He reports not only that Mattathias ordered the circumcision of boys who had not been circumcised, but also that he expelled those who had been appointed to prevent circumcision. That's Josephus's addition. I don't know from where, but it indicates his assumption that the people who were not circumcised were not circumcised because somebody supervised it and prevented that. And that would only apply to Jews who wanted to circumcise their children and not to non Jews. So this confirms to the first of the rabbinic assumptions I mentioned before, namely that first creates a Jewish child, and then there are obligations, including circumcision. Turning now to the main point, however, it is that contrary to the modern rabbi cited above, there are several texts that show more or less plainly, I'll start with the less plain ones, that Josephus viewed circumcision not merely as the removal of an impediment, but rather as affecting conversion. Perhaps the best known case is that of Isaphis, the king of Adiabene. <clears throat> These translations from Josephus are mine. Who began living according to Jewish laws and eventually wanted to convert and become stably or fully the bios, judaios. I'll get back to that word in a minute. Namely, by being circumcised. According to Josephus' story, some advisors were afraid that such a step would arouse opposition among his subjects and they advised him to abstain from conversion. What is important here is that the advisor Josephus quotes did not tell Isaphis he could be a Jew without circumcision. Rather, he told him he could worship the deity, Toteon Seben, without circumcision. Ancient sources give plenty of evidence for God-fearers, Sebomnoi Tonteon, who are not Jews, although some are on the fringes of the Jewish community. And here we have Josephus telling us that the difference between them and Jews is circumcision. Indeed, it might even be that Josephus, or his source, underlines here that without circumcision, Isathus would not be a Jew by saying he could worship the deity, Toteon, which is a substantive and sounds more universal than God, the usual word for which would be Toteon. 
Be that as it may, I will observe that although it is not impossible that Josephus means that his office's practice of Jewish customs would make him a Jew were it not for the impediment of being circumcised, the phrasing tends rather to another interpretation, that it is circumcision that would make him a Jew, and his other option would be to remain a non-Jewish fear of a universal deity, not a devotee of Judaism in particular. And that interpretation is supported by the use of the bias. Although some assume it means be stably a Jew, which corresponds to a usual meaning in Greek, namely since circumcision cannot be reversed, we mentioned that among the criteria. Another interpretation, I think a closer one, is suggested by a parallel in Josephus' own prose in War 2, 463. Here in his discussion of attacks on Jews in Syrian cities around the beginning of the Judean rebellion against Rome in 66 CE, Josephus refers to Judaizers, people who are doing things like Jews, who were not fully Jews. He terms such a person mixed, somewhere in between non-Jews and Jews, many menon, in contrast to someone who is, from the Syrian's point of view, bebaios aloftulo, which Thackeray renders as outright alien, Mason is an actual foreigner. That is, the sense is not so much stable, namely unchangeable, but rather full. For those Hebrew speakers among you, I'll tell you that Shelley translates here, the Hiyot Yudi Mamash is the, way, is the way he handles the passage about Isaacus. It's not a matter of reversibility or not, it's rather being fully a Jew. According to the rabbinic position, Circumcision doesn't make you fully a Jew. It only removes an impediment to being fully a Jew in the wake of the commitments you have undertaken. Another statement of that position, and this time it's clearer because there is no other Jewish observance to complicate the matter, comes at War 2, 454, where Josephus reports to a Roman officer named the Senior, in turn, the Jewish captors in Jerusalem might kill him. Pleaded with them and promised that quote the Judaized even as far as circumcision, even as far as the Shariton paraphrased that the city of Syria's Judaizing was a broad concept and was willing to go as far as circumcision, that is, conversion. In its rhetorical context, in which Vitilius meant he would do whatever it took to save his life, the implication is that there was no further he could go. If Matilius or Josephus had thought as the 20th century rabbis mentioned above thought, that circumcision only renders an impediment, there would be much more to which they could and should refer. Matilius hasn't been practicing or learning to be a Jew. Indeed, if we were trying to imagine what that something more might be, presumably we'd think of Jewish observance, such as Sabbath and dietary laws. However, a glance at the work of Josephus's younger contemporary, Juvenal, shows that in fact, he considered the observance of Shabbat and Kashrut among the preliminaries which sympathizers first undertake, only eventually going so far as to be circumcised. And he writes famous passages, some happen to have been dealt a father who respects the Sabbath. They worship nothing except the clouds and the spirit of the sky. They think there's no difference between pork, which their fathers abstain from, and human flesh. In time, they, and I would add the word even, and Cattell confirmed that Reinach added the word even in his French. They even go so far, like Matilius, to remove their foreskins. So it's coming after all of them. As it fortunately happens, however, it seems that the two texts that most clearly bespeak the assumption that circumcision makes the male non Jew into a Jew happen to come in the two books I'm writing on. They're usually, and they're usually taken to be the closest one can possibly come to Josephus' own phrasing without help of sources or editors. As Thackeray put it in the passage here, in Antiquities 20 and its appendix to life, we probably come nearer than anywhere else to the obsessing of Erba of the author. So if you wanna know what Josephus thought, this is the best place to start. Of the two relevant texts, the first in Antiquities 20 is a nasty report about Berenike, Bernice, a daughter of Agrippa I and great-granddaughter of Herod, who first wheedled Pogamo of Cilicia to be circumcised and married him. Starts off badly for her. But later she deserted him. Whereupon he was freed, as Josephus put it, probably enjoying himself, 
She was freed at one and the same time, both of her and of the need to persevere in observing Jewish customs. Now, Josephus never told us that Pogamo undertook Jewish customs. All he told us was that he was circumcised. So he's like Matilius, who we hear of nothing that precedes the act of circumcision, and nevertheless, he is becoming a Jew. Josephus says when somebody is circumcised, he has undertaken the obligations, and not he has undertaken the obligations and eventually becomes a Jew, and the other option that Patel was talking about uh, this morning. Similarly, in Josephus' autobiography in Life 122, 123, we find the report that when two refugees from the Prochemites in northern Palestine showed up in Sepphoris while Josephus was military governor of the Galilee, his soldiers demanded they be circumcised if they wanted to remain among them. That's all that is said. Now, hypothetically, all that is needed to understand that is the presumption that I mentioned before that they considered foreskins reprehensible. We don't want people with foreskins among us in the land of Israel. However, the way Josephus re rejects their demand shows us that that minimal interpretation is not enough. Josephus insisted, or so he claims, know, that it was proper that every person worship God, Tom Teon Eusebein, in accordance with his own preferences. However, just as in Antiquities 20 about Bernice, so too here in the life, nothing's been said about a demand concerning worship. The only demand that's been mentioned is of circumcision. So again, it's clear that for Josephus to demand that the refugees be circumcised was to demand that they become Jewish with the, all the obligations that entails. That's the precise opposite of the rabbinic position with which we began, which would only contemplate circumcision as removing an impediment after a prospective convert has already demonstrated willingness and experience in performing sincerely the obligations of Judaism. If we were now to ask why 20th century rabbis would or could consider circumcision to be only the removal of an impediment to conversion, while Josephus, and perhaps also some of his predecessors, including his hot headed soldiers in Sepphoris, thought circumcision itself constituted the process, there would appear to be two main answers. One is fairly trivial, but it is nevertheless an obvious one in the modern world. In the modern world, as already in the medieval world, circumcision is practiced by many, whether it's a matter of aesthetics or health, or with millions and millions of Muslims, a matter of religion. Accordingly, circumcision does not serve to identify Jews. In antiquity, however, whatever the realities were, it was often thought to identify Jews. Recall, for example, Juvenal's statement towards the end of the paragraph, that after these people become Jews, they will only show the way to the fountain to the circumcised, which for him therefore means Jews. That obviously means Jews. Similarly, we have here another part of that same mission I quoted before, which goes so far as to assert that if a Jew makes a vow that refers to the circumcised, it refers to Jews, even if they're uncircumcised, and does not refer to Gentiles, even if they are circumcised. This is talking about the technical issue of how to interpret legally binding words. And the Mishnah assumes that when you say Arelim, you mean Gentiles. When you say Himalim, you mean Jews. And it doesn't really matter what the facts of their respective bodies are. The other answer will lead us further afield. It would lead us further afield, but I'm not going to do it. And here I can only hint at Josephus was a priest. He was a Kohen. And he grew up in a time and in a context, namely Jerusalem in the days of the temple, when all that made a difference. The existence of the temple endowed priests with importance, endowed them with monopolies and significance. Priests could do things, sacred things, that others could not do. But priests were defined by their birth, by their pedigree. Those who were born to Aaronite fathers were priests, those who were not were not, and there was nothing they could do about it in either direction. Priests were always priests, whether they wanted to be priests or not. Non-priests could never be priests, even if they wanted to and learned all that it meant. But if priestly birth was so important, it made sense for priests to believe that all pedigree was important. That's where my view about the Damascus doctrine came from. That would explain why priests sit before the Levites, the Levites sit before Israel, and Israel sits before Gerim. 
By all rights, then, it should have also led priests to deny Gentiles all place in Israelite society, maybe in Jewish society, but not in Israelite society. It should preclude conversion to Judaism. And indeed, I think that in Qumran, they did not admit it possible to convert somebody and change somebody into a Jew. It's nice that they come to the community, they can sit in the back row. Josephus, however, was not only a priest. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Josephus, however, was not only a priest. He lived between worlds. And by the time he wrote the Antiquities, moreover, 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, the world in which priestly birth made a difference no longer existed. Jews all around them, including early Christians and early rabbis, were seeking universal freedom. Conversion was a well-known phenomenon, and Josephus, as Philo and others, was obviously proud of it. It seems, therefore, that his view on circumcision making a man into a convert should be understood as a compromise between a priestly view, which says that a man's body is immutable, and if it's born non-Jewish, it remains non-Jewish, and the universalistic view that allows for conversion. By insisting that circumcision makes a person into a Jew, Josephus was retaining the priestly position as the identity of the body that identifies the person, modifying it only insofar as he's now allowing for a new identity if the body is changed. Years ago, I wrote an article arguing that Josephus did not think women could convert to Judaism because their bodies did not change in the process. Today, I'm merely writing a long footnote to that, which I'll conclude by noting that Josephus thought the conversion worked for men precisely because their bodies did change and everything else beyond that is secondary, just like it is for priests. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I'm pointing to Josephus as a as an example that survived of the way people talked about these things in the first century. And um, today, I think it would, things change, right? precisely my point. We would not say somebody, if we mentioned somebody was circumcised, I don't think any of us would infer anything about his religious practice. We might ask the question because it suggests an issue, but it doesn't uh, allow Josephus, it wouldn't allow us to assume it in the way Josephus is assuming I said circumcised, of course I meant became a Jew. And Jews have their obligations. Uh, uh, how learned was Josephus? What exactly, what curriculum exactly should he have been learning in the first century? He's very proud of himself of being very learned Jew, but he's also generally arrogant and likes to, pra to praise himself. Uh, so I, I wouldn't push that very far. I would say this is first century parlance by a priest, a Kohen from Jerusalem, and that's good enough for me. So I'll go a little bit, I'll go a little bit further and say that the part of the paper that I skipped because of time has to do with rabbis as opposed to priests. And then rabbis are not products of birth. They're products of decision-making and commitment-making by themselves and by their communities and by their teachers. And for them, I think it therefore makes sense for them to put a whole lot more weight uh, on the same processes for the candidate to becoming a Jew than priests who are used to saying, I'm a priest because of uh, well, the way my body is. I'll put it that way. My body is a product of the particular seed that created the body. Your body can change and become a Jewish body too. Uh, probably there were people in the first century, just like do another way. In the second century BCE, uh, the Idumeans converted, were converted, used the word forcibly, which is definitely found in some of the sources. People argue was it forcible or not, but you look and you see the Hasmonean didn't really continue doing that with other conquered people. And if you wonder why, maybe somebody came to the conclusion it doesn't really work. Yeah, so maybe there were people like that as well. Nevertheless, we have Josephus speaking about individuals and other whole people like Idumeans for whom his assertion is it should work or on contrary, 
for it. He says, we will not circumcise those people because we want to allow them to do something else. Not much. Uh, I say not not much. I uh, see that the people had no compunctions about writing using the word ma'us, which is a pretty heavy word uh, to describe it. Does that mean that since we all know it shouldn't be there by according to Jewish law, therefore it's ma'us? I doubt it. It sounds to me more like since it's ma'us, Jewish law demands that we get rid of it. But I don't know whether it's an aesthetic thing or what it might be. I don't really know. You know, I, I thought the validity depends on the commitment. That was the argument. Right. And the impediment is getting rid of the impediment. Okay. The, one of these rabbinic responses talks about compares with such a person to Tovel uh, Besheret Biyadot. If you want to go into a mikvah and you're holding a reptile which makes you impure, you're doing something which, uh, what's the word, uh, invalidates the efficacy of the mikvah. Right, but that's not trying to get it. There's something more going on. Neither is like a I don't see the distinction there. I think that the, the mikvah should make this person pure, but what can you do? He, he's got something with him which stops that from happening. The commitment to becoming a Jew should make you a Jew, but what can you do? You've got something which Jewish law considers to be disgusting. I see that there's not very parallel pieces. Yes, I'm going to ask a follow-up in this one. Sorry. I, I want to talk about the gender issue, right? That we, you actually refer to it a few times, but if it is, is it something that right, gets in the way that women don't have, so they don't need it? Or is it something, if you're towards the commitment side of it, right? So women should have something parallel, or I don't know, in order to get the commitment and they're not doing it. So the describing what, what's the mechanics of it? I, I would say it probably was easier for Josephus to think that the act of circumcision, which makes you a Jew, does something for the Jewish, for the, for the male, that isn't done for the female. And that would be a problem. The rabbinic way I was talking about, would say, well, women are lucky, they don't have this problem to begin with. Men have to be fixed before they become Jews if they want to become Jews. Just a quick answer to this. Uh, Tiger and Dar in their Shemtomi Yerbeni 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 Yerbeni
too holy. So to chatzitsa is when something, is when immersion is invalidated because there's something between you and the water. Uh, uh, like if, if, if you go to a ritual bath, you have to make sure there's nothing which preventing the water coming to your skin. To call circumc to call immersion when you are uncircumcised a problem from the point of view of chatzitsa is to assume what we're talking about, the, discussing, is to assume that this foreskin is not really part of your body. That's the circle. They don't have that. They don't have that problem. Which is not the same as the other shadow beard. Oh, I'm not sure it's the same problem. Okay. Uh, Daniela, yes. The difference between the Sahara mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. Is there a signal that it's uh, you know, until it's down the center? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That feeling is different between the sound and talking about the As a matter of law, I don't think so. I would say to the rabbi about this, but in, I think in people's feelings, I've said it before, people are saying, I think it was a word revulsion. Right? Who's going to feel uncomfortable when they realize the person in the box is not certain? Okay, thank you very much. Two wonderful papers. Thank you very much, both of you.